I'm Charles Bartlett from the University of Delaware. Okay, so if you go to your key for the Delphacids north of Mexico, and we look at the very first couplet, the first couplet has to do with the calcar, the spur, and it reads, post-tibial spur, the calcar is spine-like, circular or quadrate in cross-section, not bearing teeth on the hind margin, as opposed to post-tibial spur flattened, usually tectiform, which is tent-like, or foliaceous, which is leaf-like, usually bearing flat tip teeth on the posterior margin. Um, so what we have, if you're able to find the spur and, and reveal it, Right here is the spur. It is flattened. There's a row of black tip teeth that is a little obscure because I've got to turn it just a little bit to see it more clearly. So this spur is uh, not spine-like, but rather flattened. And it also bears a row of teeth on the posterior margin. And that is what you're going to expect to see essentially all the time in interceptions. If you see anything else, then you have something interested, interesting, or you've got one of a small number of taxa of Delphacini that, for whatever reason, lack those uh, teeth. So with that, we go to couplet three. There's only two, two species in North America that, that have a, a spine-like spur, so we go to couplet three. And we immediately are struck with needing to see features of the genitalia. Um, once you're sufficiently familiar with things, you can skip some of these because you'll know. Bring this up so you can sort of see it. I'm going to get it in lateral view. <clears throat> so, couplet three reads Ediagus with sperm conducting tube strongly sclerotized and clearly evident. So, here is the Ediagus. I guess I can give that. A little more magnification. Focus it a little better. And here is the Ediagus. And the Ediagus is a, a kind of a single, more or less uniform structure. If the sperm conducting tube were evident, what we would see is kind of a dark tube in the middle of this, um, but we don't see that. If we continue on reading the couplet, it says vestigial adiagal flagellum, which is something very similar to what we saw in the succeedae, a bit off the end of the adiagus, may be present, but there is no flagellum here. Adiagus, either with well-developed phallocica incompletely covering the adiagus, but in this case, we have a uniform structure. We do not see a sperm conducting tube. We do not see the phallocica separate from the ediagus. We have this one uniform structure. And we can continue to read about the nature of the phallobase and the, the ediagus, but none of that will uh, uh, be true of this particular thing. We get to a point in the couplet where it reads, or having one to two elongate subapical processes. So, sub the, so here is segment 10, of course. This is segment 9. If the subapical processes were present, they would be extending out from here. Um, that is a feature of the, the subfamily Colissiini. If this were Colissiini, the uh, suspensorium, which is present right here, the suspensorium would be absent also. So. All of these things are suggesting that this particular couplet
couplet, we need to go the other direction. So the other side of the couplet reads, uh, couplet three, adiagus with sperm conducting tube not evident, and that's the case here uh, with distinct, uh, sorry, adiagus sperm conducting tube not conspicuous, adiagus fused with phallocica to form theca, adiagus flagellum absent, process is never present from the link of the adiagus and the anal segment. So that's where we are. And those features, that combination of features, the uh, phallotheca and the adiagus being infused and the absence of a subanal process, that tells us that what we're dealing with is the tribe Delphacini. And that's probably the only thing, well, it's the only thing you're likely to see in interceptions anyway. Um, so that will be true. Uh, uh, sorry, the Delphacinae, that will be true of, of all, essentially all the things you, you look at. So that brings us to couplet seven is separating the tribe uh, Saccharosidinae from the tribe Delphacini. Uh, if we had tropodocephalines in North America, I'd have to separate them here too, but we do not. So couplet seven reads fragile forms, usually green or yellowish green. This, uh, I will put the specimen back up. So here is the specimen you should be looking at. Is this green? No. Is this fragile? No. Um, when you see a Sarkara Sid 9, you will know it for being both green and fragile. Uh, continue on hours with an acutely pointed head and lateral view. We'll just take a look at that for fun. Is this head acutely pointed and lateral view? No, it is not. So the next part of the couplet tells you about the posterior spines on the on the hind tibia and the nature of the ediagus. Uh, none of which we have to look at because none of that will apply to the specimen. This specimen goes the other direction where it reads form various, usually stout, lack any above features. Um, there are some with a pointed head and the posterior spines of the posterior tibia having two inner and three outer. So that brings us to the tribe Delphacini. All right, good. Couplet eight. The easiest way to, to evaluate couplet eight is look at it from frontal view. So I'm going to turn this, look at it in frontal view so we can see the antennae. We're going to turn it a little bit so we can see the face. Here we are looking at the face. And the couplet eight reads, antennal segments, at least basal, the first segment, flattened in cross-section or antennal segments, terete, which means rounded in cross-section. So if we look at the antennae, um, you will discover fairly quickly that these antennal segments are flattened. You can see it reasonably well, particularly on the right-hand side. So antennal flattened, so we're going to go on to couplet nine. Couplet nine reads, fronds very broad dorsally, rather peltate, which means kind of five-sided. Median crinia of the fronds forked, a strongly forked about three quarters of the distance between the vertex and the frontal clypeal suture. Um, all of that means is that the shape of the face, uh, if, if this were true, the shape of the face would be the top of the face would be broad, it'd be narrowed down here, and the median crinae, which you can see down here, would be forked down here somewhere, but you can see it's forked a little further than that. So this is as opposed to the fronds, as, as fronds not peltate, not as broad dorsally. Uh, in this particular case, I would say the fronds 
is rather parallel sided. Now the front is rather parallel sided. It is not peltate, so it is um, not the genus Bostera. And that sends us off to couplet 10. Couplet 10 reads larger species, four and a half millimeters. If you look at this guy in particular, or this girl in this case, particularly if you had a way of measuring it simply, you would discover that this specimen does indeed exceed four millimeters. Dark colored with broad, pale, dorsal, median, vita. So get it right side up. And you can see right in here, it is broadly pale, medially, and dark laterally. So, so far, this seems to work. Macropterous specimens, a uh, macropterous, usually, fronds strongly bicolored. So we go back to the face, and we see when we look at the face that, indeed, it's dark up here, and it's pale down there. That would constitute uh, strongly bicolored, dark dorsally, pale ventrally. Pygopher opening with two processes on ventral margin. Now, I do want to show you this feature. So what we're looking for is, of course, the pygopher is segment nine, and that this whole structure, and the opening of, of the pygopher is what we're kind of looking at here, and I'll, I'll, once I'm done putzing with it, I'll show you a little better. So this is kind of the area that we call the pygopher opening. I am going to rotate this so we have it a little bit more at side view. In fact, I might get it to its completely lateral view. And you can see, maybe you can see right in here, there's a pair of projections that happen to be on the opening of the pygopher just in front of and below the paramers. Those are the processes that we're looking for. So pygopher opening with two processes on the ventral margin, adventive on sugar cane. So that is. Perkinsiella saccharacida, adventive on sugarcane. It has now made its way throughout the New World. Everywhere that sugarcane is grown, you find this creature. Um, adventive to, from Australia or that part of the world, anyway. Very easy to recognize, partly because it's so big, partly because there are very few, few species that have flattened antennae. Um, partly the nature of the, of the genitalia is pretty unique, but I wanted to show the uh, processes on the pygopher um, because we'll be asked about that um, in a different, uh, in, in, as we go through for a different taxon. Um, normally, you would look for them by keeping the, the pygopher in direct caudal view and just looking in front of the Paramirrors, but it's a little hard to see um, if I move it that way. I, I know precisely what I'm looking for, so I can find them, but I'm not sure I can point them out cleanly. And it would be right, right in there. Now, I should point out that the genus Perkinsiella is actually a fairly large genus. There's at least eight species of Perkinsiella that are on sugarcane. This is the only one that's been adventive in the New World. Um, the Old World is a different story. <laughs> There's, I think, 20 or 25 or 27 species of Perkinsiella, um, probably all of which are on sugarcane. <coughs> 